I will take the risk to play something very meditative related to the Sufism in Islam. Well, I think even in the daytime, in the weekdays, there is always an opening for spirituality. Tina Malcolmson, and I'm uh, in the English department at Base College, and I'm also a, the co-chair of the board at Peace at Tremaine. And uh, the USM Office of Multicultural Student Affairs at Peace at Tremaine uh, put work together to organize this event, and we're so delighted to have you here. We are here today because our country has again entered into a state of war. We felt it was important for our community to consider why this is the case and what the options are before us. We have a set of wonderful panelists here today, and I'd like, well, here they are, so. <laughs> so I'm Larry Danziger, welcome. Good morning to those of you who uh, had a good morning and don't want to lose it. Uh, and for the rest of you, good afternoon, and I uh, want to let you know about uh, ba some basic goals that we're gonna have for this T-Trend. One of those is simply to hear from people who you might not otherwise hear from because if you're just reading the newspaper or listening to the media, you may get a lot of uh, media voices, but not necessarily people who have lived there, been there, and are familiar with the region. Another is simply to broaden the knowledge, understanding of the culture and the conflicts and uh, the ups and downs of what is going on in the Middle East right now. And uh, we have people from several different countries, that, so you'll find out about various parts of that Middle East. And thirdly, uh, hopefully you'll get some ideas of the role of the United States in that region, uh, what you think the role should be, if any, uh, role or roles, and also, hopefully, some ideas of things that you feel should be done, and maybe you'll even go out and do them yourself. So that's the... That's the uh, goals for our session today. We're gonna start with each of the four panelists speaking briefly, somewhere between five and seven minutes. Then we'll go to questions and answers. Uh, sometimes questions begin with long or short statements. We hope those statements will be short uh, so that we can have as many people have the opportunity to speak as possible. And I'll go back to this again, but our goal is to have a wide variety and diversity of people who will be asking questions or making comments after the uh, four speakers. And those speakers, of course, will also respond to various questions and comments as well. Um, one other quick thing. Uh, on the flyer, it talks about ISIS, the Islamic State in uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, but some people use the word ISIL, I-S-I-L, and I discovered there is another term, uh, D-A-I-I-S-H, Daesh, I think it's probably pronounced, 
which is the Arabic version of the same organization. So I don't know if anybody will use that, but it is all, these are all somewhat interchangeable terms. Actually, I have a question I want to answer on the, on the process of, of talking. Is, this, is negotiation with ISIS an option? And if not, why not? I saw an article by Robert Fisk in The Independent a few days ago which was suggesting the idea of negotiating with ISIS. And he said, I quote, it's perfectly reasonable to negotiate with villains like ISIS, so we don't, why don't we do it and save some lives? And this was September 28th. And also, according to AFP, they were quoting ex-Secretary Benita, a uh, Secretary of Defense, saying in his upcoming memoir that the fighting with ISIS might go for 30 years. And also, we have a model. Already we have a model that Turkey exchanged prisoners with ISIS to release its diplomats in Mosul, according to the Times of London, where 180 ISIS fighters for its uh, 46 diplomats who were released. Though the, Turks, the Turkish government refused to give details how it made such a deal with ISIS. The Times of London said that some of European passport holders who are the most dangerous to Europe were part of the deal with ISIS. The UN administration is having direct talks with Taliban in Qatar for years now, after years of war and in Afghanistan. Those to Afghanistan still the same both for Afghans and the American soldiers. I think this idea, I think this idea may, might come to many of you. Not only Fisk, especially. Sorry, I think the idea might came to many, not only Fisk, especially who are against violence or people afraid for their taxes to go in vain or me who might accept any idea that might stop the massacre in my country. We are all want peace, but is peace an option to ISIS? Is ISIS violence different? And if so, why it is different? Is ISIS a normal enemy we can shake hands with after reaching an agreement? Or is ISIS a different kind of enemy, different than Al-Qaeda itself? And to what extent? What about the beheadings of American journalists and British aid workers? What about playing soccer with heads of beheaded Iraqi and Syrian men and women? What about mass killing and mass graves in Spiker base in Iraq when they killed about 1,700 human beings in cold blood? What about training kids about 12 or 13 years of age in training camps on using an AK-47 or making a bomb. They even trained them on hatred to everybody who is against the caliph. All of they can see repeatedly on the net which they pose. All of, all of they can see repeatedly on the net which they post on a daily basis and brag about it. I think al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS and his group think or believe that who is not like them is not going to be with them. There is no other option for us, whether, whether we be with them or with freedom and peace. They are the only ones who kill only for the sake of killing. They are the real zombies, as one Iraqi writer put it. Now that they are about to take Kobani, on the Syrian-Turkish border, which is a town, how many prisoners they will take? Just a question. Also, a few weeks ago, they captured Sinja in Sinja Mountain and killed everybody they can kill, including children, women, and old people. And I'm sure many saw the images of the children who managed to escape. How they looked after days of walking to get to safety. President Obama used what they did in the town as the main excuse to start launching airstrikes in Iraq, not to forget what they did in Mosul and how they simply destroyed the whole heritage of the city by detonating most of the old buildings, ancient mosques, churches, 
and how they kicked out all the Christian community from the city where they left the city without Christians for the first time in about 2,000 years. The UN mission in Iraq said that a total of at least 1,119 Iraqis were killed in September and another 1,946 were injured in act of terrorism and violence only in September. They are like, I think, they are like a moving cloud. I think they are like a moving cloud of chemical weapons or like a locus, a locus, a locus, a locus during famine where they eat everything on their way. These people will keep killing every human being on their way as long as they have the millions of dollars they gain daily from protection money and oil smuggling, which enables them to buy strong weaponry and bread and, and breed and breed daily from and breed daily through internet. For example, this is a recent example I discovered yesterday. A Sunni student in the other part of the world, Australia, called Mash'an al suhail His family reported that he was missing two weeks ago. Yesterday, they discovered that he left his university in Australia to join ISIS after traveling from Australia to Malaysia, Turkey, Syria, and finally in Iraq. ISIS is an idea. And I think the question is how we can eliminate this fanatic idea rather than shaking hands with them, with the people who carry such a virus. Thank you very much. Uh, I did not identify much about Ali, but Ali is from Iraq. He is a journalist. He is in this country now, and he hopes to stay in this country. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, and our next speaker... Okay, I think uh, it'll be uh, Sanem Aslan, uh, who's at the in the Political Science Department at Bates College. Uh, Sanem is from Turkey and will be talking some about uh, the situation in Turkey and how that is influencing what's going on in the Middle East. Um, Sanem has written several, uh, um, well, at least one book, I know, Nation Building in Turkey and, and Morocco, and uh, is uh, teaching courses in the Middle East at Base College right now. Sanem? Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so today, as Ali mentioned uh, about Kobani, I will actually talk a little bit about Kobani and Turkey's position in the fight against ISIS and uh, how actually Kurds are related to this issue. So uh, as you probably know, uh, for the last three weeks, Syrian border town Kobani has been under uh, attack by Islamic State fighters. Uh, this town is one of the three autonomous Kurdish enclaves in uh, northern Syria and Kobani is very important for several reasons. One is the fall of Kobani actually represents uh, a major threat against the Kurdish demands for autonomy. Uh, Kurdish movements or the Kurdish nationalist movements um, are one of the strongest nationalist movements today. Uh, I'm saying, you know, Kurdish nationalist movements because although they look united, they are actually quite fragmented. Uh, Kurdish nationalism emerged as a direct result of the nation-building policies of the respective states in Iraq and Syria. The Kurds were subjected to a set of Arabization policies. In Turkey, uh, Kurds were subjected to a set of Turkification policies. And we can talk about, you know, this uh, in the Q&A session. Um, and um, in Iraq, uh, as you know, there is now a Kurdish regional government that effectively rules in northern Iraq. In Syria, after the start of the uprising, uh, Kurds actually declared autonomy in, in, in July 2012. During the civil war in Syria, the Syrian government um, uh, forces have ab abandoned many Kurdish populated areas, leaving the Kurds uh, to govern these uh, areas uh, autonomously. And as I said, you know, we are not really talking about a very homogenous movement here. Like in Syria, there are around 16, you know, Kurdish political parties. 
there are parties that are close to the Barzani, uh, you know, uh, movement in Iraq. There are parties that are close to Taliban in, um, in in Iraq, and there is also uh, the PYD that is uh, close to the PKK, which is the insurgency in uh, the Kurdish uh, military wing. Uh, in the in Turkey, of course, again in Turkey, you know, uh, this is a big moment. They have political parties, you know, uh, uh, and there is uh, this the military uh, organization. And we can talk about it again in detail. This is pretty uh, complicated. So Kobani actually became a symbol of Kurdish resistance against ISIS. Kurdish armed forces have emerged, uh, as you know, as the most effective ground forces uh, against ISIS, both in Syria and in Iraq. And today, Kurds are saying that the, um, um, uh, the uh, airstrikes are actually ineffective and that they are asking for heavy ammunition and weaponry uh, from the uh, United States and the uh, international community. And of course, Kobani has a very strategic location. It is uh, around one mile away from uh, Turkey. Uh, so it is uh, uh, you know, being watched. You know, what's happening in Kobani is being watched by the Turkish government. Uh, Turkey has a very long uh, and the poorest border uh, with Syria and uh, Turkey is known to be the uh, main route for the passage of uh, Islamic State militants into Syria. It has become a black market for ISIS uh, sales of oil and antiquities uh, and also Turkey is important because it is a major military power in the Middle East. It has the Egyptian air base uh, where the United States uh, Air Force uh, wing is based. And yet Turkey is highly reluctant uh, to fight against ISIS. So it first actually used this excuse that you already mentioned uh, when ISIS moved into Mosul. Uh, they captured 49 Turkish diplomats and uh, for about three months uh, they were held hostage by ISIS. A few weeks ago, actually, they were released. So Turkey was using this as an excuse uh, to not uh, join the, you know, anti-ISIS coalition because I, uh, because of, um, you know, because they were afraid of the lives of, uh, for the lives of the, the Turkish diplomats. But uh, Turkey also sees ISIS as a proxy to defeat the Assad regime limiting the power and influence of the Alawite Shiite uh, axis. So there is also another dimension of this for Turkey, because Turkey is saying, OK, we, can, we will move against ISIS only if uh, this, these airstrikes actually expand and the aim of the airstrikes become you know, to depose Assad uh, in Syria. And um, Turkey also sees ISIS as an opportunity to destroy the Kurdish autonomous administration in Syria that is very closely linked with the PKK. Uh, because this, you know, the formation of a uh, Kurdish autonomy in Syria, along with uh, Iraq, actually feeds into the government's anxieties over the Kurdish populations, the Turkey's Kurdish populations, nationalist aspirations. Um, and there has been actually a peace process that was going on uh, between the Turkish government and the PKK in Turkey and the, uh, the Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of the PKK who is now imprisoned uh, in Turkey has been actually warning that if there was a massacre of Kurds in Kobani, if ISIS actually captures Kobani, that uh, the peace process is going to collapse. So Turkey is now under this different pressures uh, and uh, while uh, it is said to provide some support to, to ISIS, um, and right now also it is also afraid of ISIS uh, threats that uh, there is a likelihood that if it turns against ISIS that ISIS might attack uh, Turkey because there are uh, some recruits of ISIS uh, in Turkey. So there are these, you know, uh, different pressure, pressures uh, on Turkey uh, about, uh, about ISIS. Um, there is actually, um, Turkey proposed the formation of a security zone uh, on Syrian soil uh, for humanitarian purposes, a safe, the creation of a safe haven for 1.5 million uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, uh, and Kurds are very, very skeptical, both Kurds in Syria and in Turkey are very skeptical of uh, Turkey, you know, forming this safe haven because they think that this is basically Turkey just wants to be involved in Syria militarily in order to crush the 
uh, the, the, the Kurdish uh, movement. So why don't I stop there? It's actually um, a little bit uh, more complicated. I just tried to give you a very <laughs> brief summary so we can talk about, you know, uh, during the Q&A. Okay. Yes, as we can see, there are many complex factors going on. And we hope that a lot of the complexities that we haven't yet addressed will come out in the question and answer period also. Reza has been in the U.S. a long time. He's from Iran. He has been working at uh, at uh, USM here for how many years? Fifteen years. Fifteen years, <laughs> okay. He's also written uh, several books, and uh, children's books, and books for uh, older children as well. So uh, he'll be talking some about Iran, I believe. Is that correct? Well, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm going to offer a historic perspective and also talk about the complexity of the, of the modern uh, Middle East politics. Uh, the 13th century, Middle East saw Bulego Khan's army. Uh, the Mongolian warriors uh, from Central and North Asia invading what's now Iraq and Syria, murdering civilians, destroying towns, and terrorizing the local population, similar to what the ISS uh, militants have been doing in the way to capture Baghdad. Once uh, the Mongols burned libraries and destroyed Baghdad's famed House of Wisdom, killing so many that it said the Tigris River turned black and red with the ink from the countless books dumped on the flowing water and the blood of the city's residents. But the similarities between the ancient invaders and the reincarnation end here. Where the Mongols were non-Arab, non-Muslim, the ISIS or Daesh in Arabic militants are Muslims claiming to be of Salafi practice, are mostly Arabs of the Middle East, and are founded and uh, armed allegedly by states such as Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Qatar, to name a few. Daesh's life began with violence. It was born as an illegitimate child out of a convenient political marriage, blessed by the US and the Western powers united in their somewhat well-intended, some would say noble, but poorly planned military project to overthrow Syria's dictator Bashar al-Assad. Needless to say, once the Americans and the region's Sunni governments offered financial and, and military support to the Syrian regime, Russians and Iranians crashed the party by offering their own support to the Syrian dictator. And so began a new front in the series of proxy wars that the Sunni Saudis and Shia Iranians have been engaged uh, engaged in. Indeed, were it not for the heroic resistance of the Kurdish fighters, Peshmergan, once again the Tigris River might have changed colors. Regardless of who the Daesh are and how quickly and easily it defeated the US trained Iraqi army and in the process managed to erase the artificial boundaries between modern Iraq and Syria set by the European winners of the First World War. The arrival as an actor in the Middle East has turned new realities on the ground. The US found itself working with an old enemy, Iran, helping defeat a new enemy, Daesh, and by doing so, benefiting another enemy, Syria, while ignoring the desire, desire of an old ally, Iraqi Kurds, to seek independence from another regional friend, Iraq. Welcome to the complex politics of the Middle East and the contradictions in the U.S. foreign policy. With the genie of Daesh out of the bottle, the political fault lines of the contemporary Middle East were exposed. The hostility between the regional rivals, such as Iran and Saudi Arabia, each claiming to speak for the Muslim world, an assertion rejected by most Muslims, by the way, and engaged in bitter proxy wars in Syria, Iraq, Bahrain, and Afghanistan, to give a few examples, became quite obvious. Adding to the confusion is the ruthless competition between Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia for the control of the region, which is causing the US 
panic and forcing it to rethink uh, its policies and region as it balances its, its varied and sometimes contradictory interests, such as unconditional support for Israel and Saudi Arabia, this one for sake of cheap oil, isolating Iran, protecting the Iraqi Kurds while ignoring the Kurds in Turkey, fighting the Islamic extremism while avoiding getting caught in the sectarian violence, and so on. Not an easy task, considering that most policymakers in Washington, D.C. suffer from Orientalism, addiction to cheap energy, and continue to see the Middle East through the lenses of European colonial powers of the past. The challenge the U.S. faces is, is in balancing its acts in a region known for its intense shifting sand dunes and uh, matching that of its political alliances. In conclusion, one such challenge involves responding to the Kurdish community's aspiration. It's faced with a historic opportunity to seek independence, asking for a friendly divorce from Iraq, a country put together by the British in a manner similar to a forced arranged marriage between Iraq's Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds, it seems the U.S. is the Kurds once again. The U.S. would rather ignore the Kurds' well-deserving demand to leave the dysfunctional family of Iraq than seeing Iraq being divided on lines of ethnic and sectarian differences. Sadly, such policy would make Americans side with Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, have followed a policy of oppression of the Kurdish minorities for years. Uh, we've heard about Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and also about the Kurds, uh, although they do not have a country, but they obviously are um, very important in this whole situation. And we're going to conclude with Ali Amida. Uh, Ali is teaches at University of New England, and I believe you're going to be talking about Libya. Am I correct? Um, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, that's right. And uh, Ali has also written two books about Libya, one about the history and culture, and the second more about uh, resistance uh, to uh, some of the uh, political activities going on in the country. So, Ali. Thank you very much, and thank you, Reza and the organizers, for inviting me here. We could talk about Libya if you want to later on. I'd be more than happy to talk, uh, to share with you my my insights. But I thought maybe uh, I'd address um, another question relating what happened to the good story of the Arab Spring uprising and revolution, and now why we ended by uh, dealing with this nasty uh, organization with violent activities. And uh, I think what I'd like to to um, share with you some insights about how to think about the two. The optimism that started 2011 and uh, people marching and, and challenging dictatorships and uh, dictatorial regimes in, in the region and calling for dignity, freedom, and rule of law. And uh, in three years, uh, the Arab Spring turn to a very, very cold winter, maybe colder than our main winters. Um, so uh, how could we make sense of a promising start with the universal values and, and, and asserting civil society, people, Muslims and Arabs and, and, and uh, other groups uh, in the region with the human faces, with the human uh, aspirations, and now we ended by really a crisis of transition. I think there are a number of, of, of points that we could probably think of to make sense of uh, the, two, the two opposing uh, events. One is to to bring the context of revolutions in a larger uh, sense. Revolutions 
are usually made by coalition people. People who are conservative, people who are liberal, people who are radical coming together to oppose a regime. No group by itself can form or, or, or um, uh, have a social movement that becomes a revolution. People have to come together. In the last 200 years, the Middle East and the rest of the colonial world have been fighting for two questions. The first one, the national question, self-determination, and also um, uh, the right for right of uh, independence from colonial powers. And the social question, that's to fight against absolutist monarchies, uh, authoritarian regimes, and recently in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, republic, the republics that actually are military dictatorships. This is the larger context. These are the larger struggles that people came together to do. Now, we also have to remember, uh, despite optimism, and despite the, the, um, uh, the euphoria we had, or many of us had earlier about these um, revolutions and uprisings, that there are also revolutions fail. Revolutions also um, face counter-revolutions. And revolutions, contrary to our American perceptions, are not an isolated event. Therefore, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Syria, what happened in Libya, and what happened in Yemen and Egypt are not isolated events away from us. The regional actors are involved. Our own government and other government in the globe are involved. And the more we grasp this really reality, the more we have access to critical knowledge. And the more we can debunk the idea that we are, as citizens, are bystanders. Our government is really a neutral uh, observer in these events. So I think the, these are the larger questions to me that will help us make sense of this awful, nasty organization, which we have to ask the question, where did they come from? What processes that will form them and lead them to, to rise? And if these processes are really are still uh, at base, even if, if this organization was uh, decap decapitated or defeated, who knows uh, uh, the, the environment that produced them might produce other organizations in the future. So uh, let me conclude without, you know, um, uh, get in, 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 in a, an elaborate way and, and be uh, uh, fruitful to to the point, and also not to take more time than than I want to. The Arab Spring revolutions uh, brought secular, liberal, and also religious opposition uh, movements and groups. Counter revolution countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and um, uh, other um, uh, monarchies saw in this revolution an opportunity to be on the offensive international organization that are the, the result of the debacles in Afghanistan and the disaster in Iraq also produce bitter um, um, alienated youth who are really see only uh, a draconian fight um, against everybody. And the, therefore, what happened in Iraq is very, very much a lead, a cause. What happened in Libya is related to what happened in Syria because in Libya it's supposed to be a good story. And what happened is, um, 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 is that the Russian government, the Chinese government, the um, Assad dictatorship thought if you compromise or if you really um, um, uh, try to um, uh, uh, make peace with, with this uh, regime uh, or allow for intervention, the result would be you know, destroying a whole country, a whole society. So therefore, I think uh, we have to look at, at the fact that the counter-revolution and the offensive, illiberal, non-democratic groups, also part of the process, and therefore, uh, unfortunately, ISIS or ISIL or Daesh are not really an aberration, but the product of all of these uh, processes and, 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 um, and movements 
that the result of a major upheaval where revolution could be defeated, unfortunately. So we have a thumbnail idea of some of the things going on in the Middle East right now. We want to try and fill in some of those gaps by having people ask questions, make comments, preferably for about two minutes or less. Uh, we have one microphone up there, and I think probably the, the best bet, because there's some noise level going on, is if you're willing to or able to go to the microphone, and if not, does this one work also? No, no. Maybe. Well, we'll, if you can't get to that microphone, we will bring a microphone to you. So. I don't really have an answer about the future on what the United States should do. I have very mixed feelings about um, some of the plans, like um, arming the moderate forces. I'm very skeptical about this. You know, I don't really know who these moderates are and uh, what the unintended consequences will be uh, of the, you know, of, of arming. Uh, but it is also very clear that you know these airstrikes have very um, um, they don't really have much effect. Maybe for the short term they might have some effect, but not for the long term. And it's a very, very complicated situation. And um, well, on the other hand, you know, when I look at the Kurds, they uh, provide some stability in the region, at least in certain parts, you know. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I really, I think I can say that. I, I really don't know. I have very mixed feelings. And uh, I think the United States, rather than trying to you know, uh, uh, create these short-term solutions, maybe think a little bit more long-term, um, and, um, uh, you know, undertake, you know, these policies that, that are more informed. Because I think, you know, it, you know, when I think about the Iraq occupation in 2003, I thought that it was a very, like, a, uh, not very well thought out uh, process, and we still actually encountered the uh, consequences I, I don't think the military uh, bombing of ISIS or ISIL is going to resolve the problem as we have discovered. They're still marshal. Uh, but also, I think um, the Obama administration is really has a very confused policy uh, toward the crisis. And granted, the American public opinion is really very suspicious for good reason. Uh, for more wars and more involvement overseas, but at the same time, bombing ISIS as the example that being looked at, which is uh, Yugoslavia, is not going to work. Uh, you know, uh, this is a much serious threat, especially the recruitment for ISIS comes not only from the Middle East and Northern Africa, but also from Europe and other parts of the globe. So this is an internationalist organization nasty one, but international is never the, the less. That's very important. Um, and I think, it, let's be clear uh, about the nature of this uh, uh, this challenge. It's going to take more just a few uh, uh, airplane bombing ISIS here and there. As far as the larger question about our American foreign policy, I think there's a lot of writing and scholarship in it. It happens that the United States foreign policy and I have to say, not only the Republican, the Democrats sometimes as well. Um, they they are you know in agreement, and often, especially during the Cold War, and if we forget about that in America, the pursuit of the American foreign policy has been about stability and, and corporate interests. And um, America, unfortunately, acts as an umpire, you know, in its foreign policy, and and, and uh, you know. And, and that's the contradiction uh, uh, that, that hasn't been resolved, which led to alliances and support for a very, very absolutist monarchy like Saudi Arabia, or the Shah of Iran, or um, uh, the Gulf states, or uh, the, the Egyptian uh, dictatorship uh, before that. So uh, you can find many, many examples for that. I think in the long run, I don't think it's consistent with our constitutional and democratic uh, aspirations. But in the long term, it hunts the United States, especially when there is no clear vision, even from a realist uh, perspective, about what to do with these um, post-September um, uh, 11 uh, uh, challenges. Uh, 
two, two, two quick answers. One, I agree with Ali that there has to be a political solution to the question of ISIS. Military uh, solution would not work in absence of some political solution. The other thing, we have to be careful. You, you can never destroy an ideology. I mean, we have to be careful when they say we're going to destroy ISIS. You can never destroy an ideology. They, would, uh, they may change names. Actors may change. They may show up elsewhere. Uh, I think the bigger question would be the US and other uh, Western powers uh, coming up with a long-term policy for the region which addresses uh, the disenfranchisement of the young people in that region, unemployment, uh, lack of education, lack of access to opportunities. I think that's what draws young persons to join terrorist groups. They are tired. Uh, they've given up hope. They'd rather go and die and, and in the process kill other innocents than, than, than be engaged in something more productive because we have removed all their opportunities. And by we, I mean the dictators in that regime, the West has been responsible, and acts of war again and again and again. Uh, so that's really what we need to, uh, earlier I talked about when was the last time we built a school. That's what exactly I mean. We need to be there, not only with our tanks and, and bombers. We need to be there with notebooks. We need to be there with our doctors. We need to gain friends. We need to prove to the people of the Middle East that, that sometimes we don't like the regimes and that we have, that's something they have in common with us. But we have nothing against them and their faith. It's never too late for us to um, find critical knowledge. And we have it in the United States. It's just we need to avoid the representations and the cliches and the simplifications that we get uh, in our, um, sometimes in our national news. And, and we have universities, we have libraries, we have good people, we have a lot of things that we could uh, pursue. And this forum, uh, so this really great form is, is the way people educated themselves in the 60s, where they, uh, the beginning of the civil rights movement, they began to teach themselves and have the discussions and panel. And listening is really, is a key uh, um, value that uh, probably would be um, uh, good to remember now, because listening means that you don't have all the answers, but you are willing to listen to the other side, and that's deeply uh, needed. A very brief comment about this actually. So, US um, actions in the Middle East are very consequential and they affect the lives of the people in the Middle East. Yet, when I look at the Americans in general, when I talk to my students, when I watch TV, I realize that there's a very, very shallow understanding of the Middle East. There's not that much of a public debate. When I watch TV, for instance, you know, when people are interviewing, you know, Middle East experts, it lasts maybe it lasts at most 10 minutes. Uh, so I actually watch more Turkish TV because in Turkey, you know, the debates are like two hours, three hours, you know. Um, so, and I try not to watch TV, I should say, in the United States. I, I read, you know, I read the New York Times, I read foreign policy, I read the articles written by scholars because the best universities, I think, are in the United States and uh, people are actually really, uh, you know, uh, creating lots of information about the Middle East. Uh, so there is that sort of a weird disconnect between, let's say, the intellectual world that is represented by the universities, by the scholars, and the people, you know? Um, so I just, um, I mean, it, to me it is amazing. I, I think it has, some, I understand the reasons, you know, people do not necessarily feel the direct threat uh, uh, coming from the Middle East to, into, to their lives, whereas, you know, uh, any Turk in, in Turkey is, of course, very, very concerned about what's happening around it, uh, you know, uh, beyond its borders because it has more direct effects. So the United States is, on the one hand, highly isolated and I would say a little bit insular, but at the same time, its policies have very serious direct effects uh, for the world uh, outside of the United States. So just just an observation. So it might be, you know, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what it looks like. Why Iranians and Saudis don't have Iraqi government? Uh, the question can be very, answered very, in a very short and simple way because Iran and Saudi Arabia are engaged in this bitter proxy war. And it's happening inside Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, and, and elsewhere. So unless these two states, and I'm making a distinction, it's not about people. 
there's no problem between people of Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's the two governments who each claim to speak for the Muslim world. Um, and they believe their version of Islam, their brand of Islam is the real thing, the other one is just fake and false. So these two would never be able to, they, they don't share the same vision for Iran. The Iranian government, being a close ally of the Shia regime in Baghdad, wants Iraq to stay intact. Um, and they share that, by the way, with the US government. It's interesting, it's strange bedfellows when it comes to Iraq. Um, Saudis really are not convinced that they want the same. I think Iran and Saudi Arabia are not with a, are not supporting a united Iran. As, as I said, everybody is supporting his people, everybody is supporting his sect, everybody is supporting the people who will benefit him if Iraq stands on feet, then they have a say on the government in the future. That's how it's seen. They, they are with Iraq, but the weak Iraq. They will support it enough to stay alive, maybe, but not to be strong enough to, to be dangerous to both states. I think we have to understand um, that the Iraqi invasion was a complete disaster, in my opinion. Not only about uh, the lies that we were told about uh, the, the, um, the, the factor behind the, the invasion, it's the manner, the way uh, the occupation and the state building uh, took place in Iraq. Uh, the old analysts, not only liberals and, and critical, even uh, respected conservative analysts, agreed that it was a disastrous uh, experiment. Uh, not only, you know, the, uh, the idea of, um, uh, you know, uh, the bastardization of the Iraqi uh, uh, political party outside of the elite, the uh, destruction of the state that existed since uh, 1920, um, a very, very strong um, uh, state that lasted for a long time, and also the lack of knowledge and the arrogance sometimes on the uh, part of uh, Bremer and others uh, led to the exclusion of segment of Iraqi society, and also uh, the, the, unfortunately, the fact that a very opportunistic group of uh, leaders, um, not to mention in Manic alone, but others, who really were in charge. That, that disastrous policy, the exclusion of many, many groups, um, I think led to a, a fertile environment for radicalization and recruitment by uh, ISIS or ISIL, including um, uh, rank and, uh, and file uh, soldiers in the Iraqi army, and uh, maybe Ba'ath um, um, party members. I think all the uh, critical analysis we know that that became an alliance or recruited by ISIS and now they are fighting the Iraqi state and uh, in a different vision. Uh, Salafism is a brand um, of Islamic um, uh, movements right now that goes back to um, uh, earlier period of Islam but also at least in the, in the 18th century of, and there are many many um, division within Salafism. Salafism means that you want to go to the good model of the early Muslims, which is called Salafs. But there is no one group. Some, many groups now in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and other parts of the, of the Muslim world, where they, you have to avoid violence, and you have to avoid, uh, also obey the authority for the peace of the Muslim community. What we're talking about now is specific group uh, some scholars who are uh, who um, study these uh, movements, they call them jihadi salafists. Means that they are not the quietest. The world is full of, of contradictions and pain. You just do good, and after our death, God will bring justice, or be quietest, or we try to avoid violence. No, these salafi jihadism, they try to say not only one of we are the true Muslims, but also we have a duty, a religious duty, to uh, fight evil, and we are correct. So here, this is completely new. By the way, it's not has nothing to do with the seventh century. This is a contemporary interpretation that tried to appropriate Islam in its own name. And there are other Salafists who are completely opposed to them as well. And we need to make that distinction. Of course, suffice to say, I think uh, we are all aware 
this is just a violent groups that does not represent the larger billion and a half Muslim community. And within Salafism, it's also controversial. Uh, as, uh, I'm not a, an expert in Salafism. Um, in fact, because I'm a Shia Muslim, according to Salafis, I'm not even a Muslim. <laughs> they are that exclusive. Some of them. Uh, so, but I want to stay away from really labeling large communities of Muslims in one or the other. So I'll add what Ali said, that there, there, there are differences within every interpretation of Islam. So there might be good non-violent Wahhabis as well as very, very violent Wahhabis, non-violent Salafis as well as very extremely violent Salafis. Rather than labeling those, I would like to frame it differently that this is where we make the distinction between Islam as a faith and political Islam. What do I mean by that? Political Islam is where an individual, a group, or state uh, uses Islam, the faith, uh, in order to reach their political goals. Because if I were a leader of a group, uh, or leader of a country, uh, if I were going to kill a number of people for my own political goals, it would be so hard, if not impossible, to raise an army, to mobilize uh, volunteers, to raise money if I were to tell them, well, I'm doing this because I want to access uh, the, the wealth, or this is purely for power. Rather than that, I would say, well, I am going to do this because, uh, because uh, my faith, Islam tells me these are not Muslims, good Muslims. And so it's, it becomes much easier to uh, raise money, to mobilize an army. So we have to be careful that political Islam is what we're hearing about. And unfortunately, in, the, in this country, in the West and the US, we seem to confuse both. Um, I would say Islam is the religion of some 1.5, 1.6 billion uh, people, very peaceful uh, people. And then there's the political Islam, which what we see and seems to be uh, making the news in this country and elsewhere. Go ahead, next question. Uh, well, it seems that our basket of terminology is full of definitions. Uh, Sunni, uh, Shia, Alawi, uh, Arab, Kurds. And I think the basket of definition actually direct our way of looking at things. What about a real definition of things, more simpler. What about the definition of a majority of people, simple people, mostly poor people who want to live a peaceful and a nice life, and economical elite who want, which wants only to accumulate more fortunes. I think this is an excellent point. Uh, I spoke about it a while ago. Uh, some of you probably uh, uh, who listen to um, our national public radio. Uh, and I, I tried to, to raise a similar question, maybe a bigger question. I'm not really convinced the lenses of um, sectarianism or the lenses of religion can uh, are really um, can capture the realities, or that the only way to look at that region, including Iraq. I, I always say that the Iraqi state, and the Syrian state for that matter, survived for a long time, um, since the 1920s, in the case of Iraq. And the, the lenses of sectarianism, Shia as a big piece of the uh, Sunnism, is really recent construction, in the sense it's politicized, and I'm not convinced that's the only way to look at the Iraqi society. But our policymakers, our media decided this is the way. Who's Sunni and who's Shia? And, and uh, as if there is no civil society, there is no role for um, majority, role for um, class, for gender, for regionalism, for other aspects of, 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 um, of those societies that lasted for quite a while. I mean, what always drives me crazy is this is a state and society that lasted from 1920 until 2003. 
So there must be something working. So I think that, that question that you raised is, is a very, very worthy one. It's true, despite the fact that everybody want to see who's Shia and who's really uh, a Sunni. And, and the regional actors, they want to define it that way too. It, it, this is really for the, the Sunni cause, uh, or this is for the Shia, uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia. And that's for political reasons. As uh, you know, uh, Reza said, Islam, like any other religion, there are multiple ways of looking at it. You look at it as, as an ideal, um, as a cultural identity, uh, as also um, a, a historical experience that is so diverse. The key to it is as diverse as our societies in the United States and also in Western Europe. And the more we capture that, the more we will not become really, com you know, uh, you know, confined to the the uh, prison of ethnicity or religion in an a historical way. Excuse me. Can I can I just interrupt you? And I, I mean, I actually ask a question to Ali um, because you brought up a very um, important point here. So, do you think that there is an Iraqi nationalism that is strong that can actually? Be an umbrella for these different um, groups, the Shiites, the Sunnis, you know, the Christians, the Kurds. Do you think that is a possibility? Yeah. Before, before answering your question, I want to just comment on, on the question. I said, it's one line, it's, it's an article on Al Hayat on, the, on September 13th, and it's the headline. It says, ISIS is the utmost expression of the Middle East current crisis. So it's our problem. ISIS is there and will stay there. If not ISIS, something else will will will, will appear, as 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 Reda said. So it's with us. Something wrong with us, the society, the Islamic society. I need to be solved. In Kurdistan, it's in Mosul. Just come on, they can get the oil. Why would you need the others? Why would you need a Sunni to govern you? Why would you need a Shia to govern you? Why would you need a Kurd to govern you if you can make your own state? I think this is, this, this is how I see it now. I'm not pessimistic, but as an Iraqi, I see it. it, it it's there. It's, the difference is there, and I don't see, I, I, I think it's the end of, I think it's the end of Iraq. Maybe, not now, but I think the seeds are there. So it's it. Uh, what I'm about to say may come as news to most of you that prior to invasion or liberation of Iraq, as Ali said, if anyone who's side you belong to, uh, Shias and Sunnis managed to get along really well. I interview my Iraqi students, some of them are here in, in this room, and I don't mean to put them on the spot, but I ask them that very question when we are alone. I say, how did Shias and Sunnis back in Iraq? And they all have assured me that the intermarriages and got along fine, and one's identity was being an Arab even more than a Iraqi, and one's identity was being a Muslim more than being a Shia or Sunni. In my own family, I grew up in Iran, my brother-in-laws are Sunnis, our sister-in-laws are Sunnis, and never ever we thought that they were different than us. Here I go to a Sunni mosque to pray, and never ever I've been questioned or made uh, to feel unwelcome. So, Again, I would invite you to go back to that political Islam, the distinction between political Islam and Islam as a faith, that this was a byproduct of political Islam. That uh, I, I sometimes compare Iraq, the nation of Iraq, to this gorgeous, beautiful race, antique race. Uh, it had been passed from one generation to another, and lots of care. Remember, I mean, Baghdad is, is an old city, a few thousand years old. And that base had been passed from one generation to another with lots of care. And then in our rush to get rid of Saddam Hussein, uh, we went and violently took that base away. In such a really sudden and violent way that it, is, you know, it, it might have been broken in the process. And my question is whether we ever be able or want to put it together, back together. 